Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 46th Legislative District Virtual Town Hall. Tonight, you're hearing from your state legislators, Senator David Prock, Representative Gillette, and Representative Javier Valdez. Tonight's event, we are talking about what happened in the 2021 legislative session that just ended in April. A lot of the questions that we're hearing tonight were submitted to us in advance through the survey. And if you are tuning in now to this live stream, you can also post questions in the comments. Staff member will make sure to get your question to our legislators. So to get us started, I am going to turn it over to our lawmakers for some brief opening remarks. Senator Frost, can you please start us off? All right, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank everyone sunny early evening. Um, it's nice for us to be able to do this and I hope everyone is enjoying the the wonderful weather. And the great thing is when we're done with this hour, you'll still be able to uh, go out and enjoy the rest of the evening, take a walk, hang out with your family, do whatever you wanna do in the beautiful weather until at least nine o'clock. So one of the best things about living in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we had a very momentous session this year. We'll get into in just a minute, uh, all of the uh, really important policies that we uh, we under undertook. I would say, uh, from in my mind, um, the themes of the session were uh, police uh, policing and justice reform, uh, COVID relief, uh, both to help our economy, but in a number of different ways, both to help our small businesses, to help people get more childcare, and uh, and I think uh, also obviously climate change was in front and center of the agenda. So those were some of the major areas that we got into. I think it was very successful in many ways uh, and momentous. And I think uh, as we get into the discussion tonight, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hear more about that. So I just wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, today. And I appreciated all of the comments and uh, emails that we got during the session. Uh, we were virtual, but we were reading all of them. And I certainly appreciated everyone's input. Again, I'm Representative Jerry Paulette, and I want to welcome you to the, our 46th District Town Hall. And um, we're going to try to get through as many of the questions as we can from those submitted in advance and those that are being posted. Uh, I want to let people know that Senator Frocht and Representative Valdez and I work very, very closely. Um, we're going to try to get through more questions by only having one of us um, respond to a question unless someone has something very special to add. And that will enable us to get through more questions. It was indeed, I think, the most historic legislative session in decades for the reasons that Senator Proctor laid out, um, also for making our tax system more fair and funding the Working Families uh, Tax Credit uh, we'll talk about climate change. We'll talk about police accountability. We'll talk about how we got out of the pandemic and are continuing to move ahead on public health. So all those issues, uh, education and many more. And hello there, I'm Javier Valdez. Um, and thank you for again, for being here tonight. Um, as my colleagues, Senator Frock and Rep Paulette uh, discussed, we will certainly do our best to get to all of your questions here tonight as best as we can. Uh, you know, in terms of, of for me, in our, in our 2021 legislative session, um, this was actually my very first year of, uh, as a committee chair. I was the brand new chair of our state government and tribal relations committee. So um, was able to help uh, get some very important uh, uh, legislation passed in those committees. And we'll get to some of that here tonight. But really proud of the work that we did to uh, ensure that once, once felons have served their time, they'll be able to uh, have their voting rights restored immediately. Uh, we established a, a new state holiday, Juneteenth. And um, as Senator Brock uh, referred to, we uh, definitely uh, made some uh, uh, movement on uh, the police accountability and um, a lot of good work. And, and myself as a member of the Transportation Committee, we also were able to uh, uh, pass a, a very strong uh, and robust budget. And we'll get to all of that tonight. So look forward to answering as many questions as we can tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for those opening remarks. We're going to go to our first question, which is from John. And John asked, a lot of amazing changes have been made at this legislative session. Can you give us an overview of the major accomplishments? 
Well, am I, I think, uh, gentlemen, am I starting with that? Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a huge question, John. I'm going to try to hit some of the key points. I want to start with where we began the session, which was in January, we were still in the midst of, uh, and we still are today, although I think we're clearly in a better place. Uh, the vaccines were just getting rolled out uh, around the country. And I think the pandemic and the pandemic recovery, as well as the uh, um, the up upheaval with the claims of a fraudulent election, which I totally disagree with, were, um, uh, were, were being presented to us. So it was a very tumultuous time. I, I can say that the legislature went, I think, first and foremost uh, in trying to pass an early um, a pandemic relief package, and it, it did a couple of key things. Number one, it um, changed and it made sure that our small businesses were not going to be hit with a massive tax increase um, uh, because of changes in their ratings for, for unemployment, for the unemployment system. So that was over a billion dollars in small business tax relief. So you hear a lot about the capital gains tax from those who are not happy, but there are a lot of people who don't understand that we actually cut taxes both for small businesses and also for individuals, as Jerry mentioned, the Working Families uh, Tax Credit. We also went to work on passing what I think was one of the key things that everyone agree, realizes we have to do, which, we, which is what we call the Fair Start for Kids Act, which is basically is a massive childcare expansion. They're talking about this at the federal level, but here at the state level, we also accomplished that. And the main thing for all the, the, the stuff in that was in the bill, and there was a lot of different programs and things, the main thing I want people to know is that what it means is that if you are lower to middle to middle low to low income if you were in that range of uh you know working family maybe uh, two incomes maybe one income but you're not making that much money but you certainly are not enough making more than would qualify you for head start there's going to be more relief available to you as uh, for subsidizing your child care if we can find it we also want to expand and and the bill aims to expand the number of child care providers very, very important bill, and it's going to be very important to see how that plays out over the year. Um, I want to talk briefly about police accountability. There's so much to say, but um, going into the session and coming out of the um, uh, the upheaval from last summer, from the murder of George Floyd and the many uh, instances around the country, including here of, uh, of cases like Manny Ellis, Charlena Lyles, uh, the legislature went to work uh, all throughout the interim in developing uh, bills that over time, if you put them all together, what we're trying to do is change the policing culture in this state to ensure that communities have more confidence that they're going to be treated fairly, particularly brown and black communities and people who have felt for a long time that they have not gotten a fair shake and are not treated fairly, uh, but also to make sure that there's more co confidence and more transparency in the system. Uh, we do need it. We do need um, police officers. We need good policing uh, departments that have a culture of accountability, a culture of of, uh, of transparency, and one that people, the communities, can have confidence in themselves. Those who are being policed, and that's what we aim to do. So there's more state oversight. There's a significant expansion of independent investigations. Um, we asked officers, we passed a bill that says if an officer sees another officer doing something wrong, then they have a duty, not just it's not subjected, they have a duty to actually intervene and ensure and stop what they see as a violation of policy or a violation of someone's civil rights. Uh, there's more data collection so we know what can what can be happening. We also change the law so that when there are bad officers who, who should not be um, uh, on the force, that they can't just be passed from department to department. And that will change as well. These were very controversial, and I think, unfortunately, at times it devolved into uh, who likes uh, uh, you're either pro-police or anti-police. But I think when people really look at the bills and the policies that we did, many of them over time are going to change the culture around um, around uh, community and enforcement in our state. And I think that was what we had to do coming out of what happened last summer. So that was a key part of our of our session. Um, I'll let maybe let Jerry and Hobbs say a couple of words about some of the other big bills that we did. Well, I know we're going to want to be talking about climate change, so I'll just hold off on that a little bit and um, say that we did a, we really put a tremendous uh, push into 
access and assistance for students attending community and technical colleges and increasing the diversity of our faculty at community and technical colleges. And this expands on the work that we've done, the three of us have helped lead over the last few years to ensure that every single person who wants to go to college in Washington will have an assurance that if you're below median income, we've got support for you to get into school and now we've got to provide that support to get you through school, the advising, the guidance, the mental health and other supports. And especially for those students who never had any other family member who's ever gone to college. We call them first generation students and they need special support and we need to give it to them. And we've made a tremendous investment there this year. Um, I'm also very proud to say that after four years of trying um, my legislation to finally ensure that we test every public school for lead in the school water so that our children aren't drinking water with levels of lead that we know reduce their IQ and cause behavioral health issues for the rest of their lives. And Governor Gardner, uh, Governor, <laughs> Governor Inslee <laughs> signed that. Wow, that was a slip. Um, Governor Inslee signed that last month, and um, uh, it's going to make a big difference in public health. And we'll be talking about public health a lot as well, I'm sure, as we go through tonight. Uh, Representative Valdez. Thank you, uh, Jerry. So, you know, in my, com my opening comments, I talked about some of the work that we did in my very first year as the chair of the State Government and Tribal Relations Committee. And I think it was just um, a monumental and historic work that we're gonna have to have an official state holiday in our state, Juneteenth, that we are finally going to, again, for, for felons who have served their time, uh, uh, no longer their voting rights will be restored, being tied to paying uh, 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 their legal financial obligations that once you serve your time, you will have your voting rights restored. Um, a small bill, which, which got some attention, I guess, from the insiders was that uh, we're now gonna have in Washington, D.C. is one of our statues and, 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 statu and statuary all, um, uh, uh, the legendary uh, 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 Billy Frank and being able to help pass those those bills all through the state government committee, um, you know, was really important work. I do want to highlight though some of the important work that we did as myself, um, as a member of our House Transportation Committee, and you know we were we knew that going into this year, because of the impacts of COVID, uh, we had a serious uh, uh, revenue uh, impacts. Uh, if it were not for the uh, 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 federal government uh, assistance, uh, we would uh, would have been in a lot worse shape. But uh, but we were able in, in this transportation budget to add more uh, more uh, support for um, um, our culverts, um, uh, more uh, uh, equity in our transportation project, uh, further investments in our multimodal, um, active transportation and transit for et cetera. Uh, you know, uh, uh, green transportation um, and uh, restoring critical funding for our, our connecting Washington projects. So being able to be a part of that, um, again, in a year when we've come, when we in January, we really thought uh, we were going to have to make uh, some uh, significant cuts in our transportation budget and budget. We were able to, uh, at least because of the help of the federal government, um, provide a budget that at least sustains things where, uh, where they are. Thank you so much for that. Our next question is from Samantha who asked, remote testimony allowed so many more people to participate this legislative session. What do we need to do in order to keep this option moving forward? Yeah, um, I'd be happy to, to take that question uh, to, to Emily. Um, I, I think it's fair to say we were all unsure in the legislature when the session started, how this all remote session was, was going to work. I think we were, of course, um, uh, hopeful and uh, that it would it would work out really well. And um, considering we had not done something like this on a full on a full platform, there had been some um, some some trial balloons. I know last year in the House where we took um, a few smaller committees took uh, public testimony, um, you know, uh, uh, during committees, but obviously. We had a full Senate and a full House going to an all virtual session, and we didn't, and we didn't know how it was going to work. Um, I think um, 
uh, reviews and, and, and op-eds have, have clearly shown that it worked really well considering um, our challenges having to be virtual. Sure, it would have been great if we had been there all in person, like you know, like we normally are, but obviously because of the pandemic, that just wasn't uh, um, uh, a thing that, you know, uh, that we could have done here in 2021. Um, but, uh, but the numbers showed, I mean, um, I think there was, a, there was an op-ed in the Seattle Times a couple weeks ago uh, by the League of Women Voters really wanting to ensure that we keep the, uh, at least um, having that engagement, of a virtual engagement where our, our residents and our citizens no longer have to go to Olympia and travel um, whether you live at, 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 at in Ponderay County and have to tra travel, you know, a, a few hundred miles to get to Olympia to testify, uh, that's clearly what the public uh, the, the the public clearly wants us to ensure that we somehow can keep this uh, option of being able to, uh, to testify uh, uh, in a remote fashion. Um, obviously, we have not. Um, I can't speak for the Senate, but uh, in the House, we I we have not had at least um, among our members with our leadership those discussions that have how that, how that will continue but i'm pretty positive there will be some type of of that activity uh being uh being kept for 2022 and so forth because clearly the public really embraced that i can speak you know to some of the some of the bills that came in front of my committee we had on a one bill i think three or four hundred people sign up to testify obviously we, we couldn't get to them but absolutely amazing um, that you would not have been able to do this, um, I guess, in the way that it's always been done, uh, which is um, having to come in, in person. So so um, to answer that, again, to uh, get back to the, to the ultimate question, I would anticipate that you will continue to see some type of ver some type of version of where the public can testify um, um, uh, in a remote fashion. But of course, it's always good, like you are today, to remind us, us legislators, that you liked it, and this is a priority, and we want to make sure that uh, uh, that we keep doing it. Great. Thank you for these questions, folks. If you are tuning in now, this is a live virtual town hall with your 46th district legislators. And if there is something you'd like to ask them, make sure to leave a question in the comments and a staff member will make sure to get your question to our lawmakers. We are moving on to another question. This one is from Jeff and Jeff asked, what, if anything, are you doing to encourage people to get vaccinated? I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question, Jeff. Um, uh, I hope that everyone who is watching and listening will, if you haven't already gotten vaccinated, you will do so. Our goal I think that I'm speaking for the three of us and for our Democratic colleagues um, was to number one goal for this session, absolutely over anything else, was to ensure that science and public health would guide our state's policy in recovering from the pandemic. And as a faculty member at the UW School of Public Health, I am incredibly proud of how this state modeled for the rest of the nation many of the policies we needed to get through the pandemic. And we know that our policies saved tens of thousands of lives. I want you to think about that. We saved tens of thousands of lives in Washington and hundreds of thousands across the nation with the steps we took. And that includes working really hard to try to have vaccination available to people. Uh, in our first uh, budget effort in the legislature to distribute federal funds, we distributed over $600 million to local governments and public health agencies for vaccination and contact tracing efforts. We can't forget, we still need contact tracing. It ain't over. We still need contact tracing. We need to know where we're having breakouts and to try to intervene, talk to people and say, you can protect yourself now and get vaccinated. Many of you are also aware that um, uh, a couple months ago, I uh, asked colleagues to join me in urging that 
Seattle Public Schools get off the dime and offer partner with the city of Seattle, which was willing to do it. Thank you, Mayor Durkin, willing to offer school based vaccination sites along with the other mobile sites that the city of Seattle has so successfully done with federal and state funds and the county and Dow Constantine has done. And they were willing to say, we're not even going to wait for the federal funds. And our job as legislators say, we've got your back. If you spend your local money, we will backfill you. And we've done a great job in Washington state, especially on uh, the west side. And sadly, we have some counties that have really dismal rates. And we have a lot of educational work to do with those counties. And that was also seen in, you know, instead of having science and public health guide the response, there were a couple of counties where local elected officials said, we're going to override or even throw out our professional MD public health officer because we don't want a science-based approach. And we have legislation that passed that said, we're going to try to improve how we organize our public health agencies to ensure that science governs them. And we put in $150 million into local public health to keep going. So we had a, quite a response and I'm very proud of what we've done, but we're not done yet. Everyone you know needs to get vaccinated unless they're immunocompromised or under 12 right now. All right. Our next question is from Midge. Senator Frock, thank you very much for your efforts to pass the Death with Dignity Amendment this year. Do you anticipate that the amendment to the Death with Dignity Law will pass in the next session? So um, the answer to the question is um, possibly. I think the the reasons that the bill did not uh, pass the Senate is there was not really a, uh, a strong champion on the majority side for the bill. And honestly, um, many in the minority uh, were against the bill. And I think it would have, uh, by the time it came up, it would have, uh, it was going to take a uh, hours and hours, maybe eight eight hours of floor time for us to debate that one bill and given the many other things that we had to do that were were uh, i know this is important to many people but given the urgency of so many other bills like that i mentioned or things like p police reform economic uh, um, recovery uh health care climate change um, it just didn't didn't make it so i think what has to happen is that the advocates for that bill uh, have to have a strategy of trying to get action to take place sooner. I also think, uh, candidly, they need to do uh, more um, explanation for members so they understand why um, some changes to the death with dignity law are, are probably warranted at this point. And I, I know that after really talking to people and get going into it in some depth, because I had to vote on it in the health care committee, um, I, I felt better about the changes that were being proposed and why. And I think there will be other, other work that needs to be done. So that's my recommendation for those that are advocating for that bill. Great, thank you very much. Our next question is from Chris, and Chris asks, armed far-right extremists are a major force in American society right now. What is the plan to defend our democracy against them? Uh, yeah, I'll be happy to take that question, um, Emily, and, and thank you to Chris for, uh, for that uh, question. Um, first, let me say that um, in terms of, of, of those um, extremists who are armed, I think one of the, the major bills that we tackled and were passed is that we're finally going to uh, uh, secure our capital campus, no longer allow uh, uh, public carry of, of firearms um, onto, on, onto our campus, where folks um, clearly um, is, are just there to uh, uh, intimidate and, and prevent things from uh, uh, our, our democracy from being a democracy and to intimidate. It also goes just uh, beyond, I guess, uh, you know, those folks who are armed, there's also uh, uh, our, our voting rights. Um, so we had actually, there was an article I read a few months ago about the uh, number of uh, bills and or the number of state legislatures that were considering uh, rolling back voters' uh, 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 voting rights or putting more roadblocks, more barriers to prevent people from exercising uh, their right to vote. 
And one of those states that was not listed was actually the uh, uh, state of Washington. But I can assure you that there were plenty of bills that were introduced in our legislature this year that actually would, whose, whose sole goal was to really prevent and to put up many roadblocks and barriers to prevent um, our residents and citizens from voting. I'll, I'll, I mean, there were um, bills, for example, that would um, uh, uh, limit uh, uh, the right to mail-in balloting. There was a bill that actually would have uh, removed uh, all of our drop boxes. Um, there were bills, um, there was one bill, for example, that um, uh, would have, uh, when it came to the election of governor, would have created, a, 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 I guess, a, a, a mini version of, of, of how, you know, of how we elect our president. But in this case, it would be by county. And then each county would then be up the votes and each county would then elect who our governor was. So it would no longer be uh, uh, the popular vote in our state. So clearly m many bills introduced that would have harmed our, our public, would have harmed our institution. Uh, fortunately, you know, none of those bills got the train because um, those bills, again, were simply damage to our state to our public. So um, I imagine we will still be seeing uh, many of these come forward in 2022 and beyond. Um, but I can assure you that um, I, and of course, I know that Senator Fox, Rep. Lepigri, will do. We will do everything in our in our ability to ensure that those those laws again that are strictly there to prevent people from voting and harming our democracy will never get past our. Um, 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 let, I'd like to just make a very brief comment on that as well. Um, I, I, everything Javier said is is, is spot on. Um, I hope that the people who are watching this, if you care about our democracy, you will remain vig vigilant about what is happening around the country. We we sh the, the 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 light should be blinking red right now. I've been reading a lot uh, this this year about how uh, countries fall from democratic systems into something else. Uh, either uh, that it's authoritarian where people don't have confidence. And we are seeing a sustained uh, real-time effort to destroy uh, the confidence that people have in democratic elections around the country. And we need to be vigilant. We need to speak up against it. We need to work with friends in other states against these measures. And we need to stand for the truth. You know, being in a, in a democracy doesn't mean that your side always wins. It means that sometimes you lose and you go back to the drawing board and you figure out how to appeal the next time in the next election. And there are unfortunately people in this country who don't seem to think that's the right system, including the former president. This is wrong and we should all be very, very concerned about it. And I, I, I think it's something really, really important, as important as almost anything else that's going on in the country right now. So I hope people will pay attention and pay attention closely. Thank you everyone for these great questions. If you are just tuning in now, this is a live virtual town hall with your 46th district legislators. And if there is a question you'd like to ask them, make sure to put it in the comment section and a staff member will relay your question to our lawmakers. We are moving on to another question. This one is from Richard and Richard asks, what did the legislature do about climate change this session? And are you in touch with climate scientists at the University of Washington? Thank you. I, I'll take that question. Um, and um, I, I was expecting a number of questions to come up tonight about climate change, as you heard from my opening remarks. So thank you very much, Richard, for being the first to get one in. And um, as I said earlier, we had a literally the most groundbreaking session did far exceeding expectations on climate change. And Washington State is now the nation's leader in having legislation on the book with a very well worked out plan for how we continue to ratchet down guaranteed reductions in carbon emissions from major sources and put the revenues that we get from the cap and invest program into renewable energy, transit, and I think very importantly, into environmental justice investments 
particularly in those communities that have had for decades the absolute worst air quality and the worst health effects and lowest life expectancies and indeed such bad air quality that we know it actually reduces children's ability to learn and to succeed in life. And we put the dollars in there, 35% will go to supporting those communities to emerge from the obfuscation of the clouds of highway emissions and diesel emissions and stationary emissions and the other contaminants, lead, arsenic, that cause the high rates of asthma and other illness in those communities, especially including pulmonary illness. Um, so very proud about that. And also we adopted the clean fuel standard, which was a huge battle and a huge step forward joining California in saying, Transportation contributes 45% of our carbon emissions. We need to have a ratcheting down of the carbon emissions from our vehicles. It's the only way we succeed. And we did it this year and we will be doing it. We even passed the goal of phasing out um, all sales of uh, gas powered vehicles in decade. So um, I would say that the one surprise note here is this. I work very hard and closely with our Native American tribes and their as sovereign government to ensure that they had a seat at the table, which is the only just and right thing to do. And the governor surprisingly vetoed that seat at the table. It's hard to understand why he did that. He's, um, we work very closely. And I think, um, well, I know I'll be introducing legislation to ensure that they have that seat at the table for local planning as chair of the local government committee. I've been working with them already, and we will do that. We will go ahead and make sure that they have a seat at the table because, as you've heard before, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. So it's time to make sure that after hundred years of genocide, we have speak to the table, and that's an even more important week when we've just heard about the uncovering of mass graves of indigenous children at residential schools in Canada. But it's not like we didn't have residential schools here in the United States. We don't have hundreds of missing Native Americans in Washington. Thank you. All right. Our next question has been asked by many people. Um, and this is, what are you doing about affordable housing, homelessness, and the related crime issues in neighborhoods and encampments here in the 56th district? Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. And um, I, I wanna say, first of all, I, I know that this is uh, on the minds of many people in our community. Uh, clearly, the pandemic situation uh, made things worse because it was not possible for um, uh, people who might otherwise have been in congregate shelter to be in congregate shelter. And I think this also high, it says, I think we also learned because of this, that where there is, um, where there is um, uh, progress being made, it's when we can actually transition people uh, from um, living unsheltered into uh, a place with four walls and a door um, if it's a if it's a hotel that a county or or uh, or a municipality has bought or is renting, or some other way, um, the results seem much better. And so we need to do that. We need to get people in that to that transition and through to the permanent support of housing. What I want people to understand is that the legislature is largely a funding source and also makes some policy changes to have a more regional approach. So, for example, Representative Paulette um, was very involved in a bill. Uh, changing uh, the rules so that other uh, county, other parts of, let's say, King County, other communities have to have a more equitable uh, approach to where uh, affordable housing might be located. You know, because we do have a situation where in the city of Seattle, because of services that are provided here, uh, Mayor Durkin, I was with something with her just yesterday, and she pointed out that 
60% of the people who are homeless, according to, to their data, are coming in from other uh, parts of the county or even other parts of the state. And so this is a phenomenon that happens, and so we do need a regional approach. So there were some policy changes in that regard. But mainly, we, we did a number of things. Number one, we provided, I mean, almost a billion dollars in eviction rental assistance uh, that will largely from the federal government, but also from some other uh, sources that we passed ourselves in House Bill 1277 that's going to really help, including uh, uh, vouchers for people who are currently living unsheltered, so we can get them, hopefully, into shelter. Number two, we provided a stable funding source for the permanent supportive uh, housing funds that we need in that same bill through an expansion of our document recording fee. And on the capital side, which I was the chair of in the House, we have record investments in, um, uh, in uh, uh, the Housing Trust Fund, as well as uh, we did something uh, somewhat different, is we created a new fund for rapid capital housing acquisition to assist local governments and communities and nonprofits in purchasing or acquiring or getting rental space to deal with people immediately who are unsheltered to the best that we can. You know, the, the Housing Trust Fund is really important. But it's the kind of thing where we make an investment and three or four years later, we have a wonderful new uh, uh, project that has 50 or 70 apartments or whatever it might be for low and moderate income people. But this other fund that we created, which I hope people will pay attention to and which we need to invest more in, is to do stuff immediately and rapidly to get people out of the encampments and into housing. But I have to say, the state government is not fully responsible for this. There are some things that we are absolutely have have had to do a better job of, namely uh, better behavioral health systems, which we are also working on to transform. And that is certainly critical and we need to do more there. But we need our city governments and our local governments to execute with the tools that we have given them. And we have given them many, whether it's uh, um, uh, funding uh, sales tax revenues that they can bond off of, direct sales tax authority that they're utilizing here in Seattle, uh, and then also these recent tools that we're working with them on. So the state needs to be a good partner with our local government and our nonprofits. We need to leverage the federal funds that we can get, but we need at the local level, the state, the city government here to execute on the policies and they need to hear from you, um, the constituents with what you see happening and needs to happen. And I think, you know, given the mayoral campaign season and the uh, council campaign seasons, both for the King County Council and the City Council, those are things that should, people should be focused on. So I would say ask your local officials and the candidates, what do you plan to do with the money that's coming down from the federal government and the state government, and how can we transform our system quickly over time into a better situation? Finally, I just want to point out that, um, well, I'll let Javier and Jerry talk about maybe the situation on 125th very quickly. Uh, Jerry, Hav, one of you want to comment there? Well, yeah. go ahead, Jerry. Um, you know, uh, the three of us met with uh, a large range of city officials about Lake City and homeless encampments. And, um, you know, just from pure public health and humanitarian aspect, at the day we met, there were over about 70 tents. That probably means 140. 150 people living homeless without shelter, proper shelters in that area. Um, we simply asked for bathrooms and water. Uh, you know, and the city put in one additional porta potty. Um, look, you've got to make a freaking priority for responding to humanitarian crises. In, it's just mind-boggling that our, you know, the city council can't do something as simple as getting water stations out when we require water stations out in for every 10 farm workers in fields. We can do it in city of Seattle. Um, and it's just astonishing to me and we need to look at it and say, we've got a public health crisis when we look at the conditions. And with work Senator Frott has done, we've got, and frankly, Mayor Durkin's work on making sure that we have um, hotels open where people can go 
and get in to a building with four walls that are your own and your own bed and social work and behavioral health supports. That's what we need to do and we can do it. We know how to do this. It's a matter of willpower, folks. If, if I too can, can add something, um, you know, as Rep. Paulette and Senator Frock alluded to, we, you know, the three of us actually, you know, met with the city. It was, I think, last November or last December, because um, we had received many uh, e um, emails and calls regarding, uh, especially um, the encampment there on, on Lake City in 125th. And, you know, I, it was very frustrating because the answer we got was, well, you know, the city council defunded the navigation team um there's not much we could do and i know i know you know as rep Paulette then you know just mentioned you know we, we you know we asked for like you know for an additional bathroom and uh but it was uh, again very frustrating that at least in that meeting we had in, in um, november or december that uh, the lack of, of of cooperation from the city on, on trying to um, help that help the residents of that encampment and help uh, make it a little safer was uh, was was just troubling, and as in, I think as many as you know, there was recently a shooting there a few months ago, or a month or so ago. Um, so we'll keep trying um, and and doing our best to um, when we hear from you to um, let the city know that they have a, a, a an obligation as well uh, to do their part. All right, thank you so much. We have a question from the live comment section. This question is from David. And David asked, how stable is transportation funding for new infrastructure or needed rebuilds? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer that question. And th thank you, David. Um, so we got, uh, and I'll just be blunt. Uh, we, we, got, we had some breaks come our way um, here in the 2021 session re um, regarding our transportation funding. Um, late last year, um, we were we were in deep trouble um, that um, our transportation budget was going to have to take deep, deep cuts on many of the uh, services and many of the things that, that we provide um, that, um, you know, our residents of our state um, e expect. We were getting hurt by um, uh, uh, because of the pandemic. We knew that um, uh, tolling revenue was down. Uh, revenue from uh, our ferries was down, um, uh, gas tax revenue down, and we were we were in trouble. But we had two things um, really ba bail us out here for uh, 2021. One is we had um, um, the Tim Hyman's initiative be ruled unconstitutional that he had on the ballot, uh, which uh, then uh, uh, freed up uh, um, uh, uh, that revenue that had been uh, the state was collecting but had not spent yet because we're awaiting the results um, um, of that lawsuit. But we also had um, um, a huge investment from our federal government um, uh, to help um, all of our states uh, to help again handle the impacts of, of, of the COVID pandemic, you know, and and our and our economies. Now going forward for um, here um, for um, our next round of budgeting here for, for 2000, I guess, and 22. A lot of it is going to depend on how those revenues um, are looking here. Um, I have not seen um, our, 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 our latest uh, numbers or forecast, but um, if we continue to see the, the numbers that we saw in 2021, uh, we are, or of course, unless we get another uh, help from the, uh, from the federal government, we are going to have to make, you know, make, uh, uh, you know, some, again, tough choices. And I mean, um, um, multimodal um, investments, um, investments in our green transportation structure, just basic, you know, our basic uh, roads and maintenance, um, you know, uh, service um, um, on public transport. You know, we made a huge investment in our Amtrak Cascades. And um, I know that we want to see, uh, can you continue to see that going forward? So, it's 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 it, it it really depends. It really depends on um, how things continue here in 2022 and uh, 2021 in our revenue, and um, and uh, let's cross fingers um, when our our, our latest uh, uh, forecasts come in that they show that we have uh, 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 rebounded and won't have to make uh, those uh, uh, draconian cuts that we thought we were going to have to make 
um, um, earlier this year. All right, we have another question in the comment section, and this one is from Heidi, who asked, getting the lead out of water in our schools is wonderful, but what's the plan for getting the lead out of paint in our buildings? Is this an issue? Uh, well, thank you, Heidi. And um, the youngest children, before they get to elementary and kindergarten, are most vulnerable. And indeed, um, we really need to look at exposure in the womb of fetuses because that is a serious exposure route. Um, and now I'm going into the medical you know, exposures for lead, but um, we, we're exploring, I'm convening public health officials, uh, public health experts from the UW and epidemiologists and um, uh, educators and looking at, do we now test for the, wa the water in uh, childcare centers and how to intervene at thousands of childcare centers to make sure that the water is safe? Or perhaps we put the money into having home visits for low income residents and test their water and the lead in their paint and intervene along with providing um, test for whether or not they have dust levels that will create are likely to cause asthma in uh, infants and children. And so th that's something we're exploring right now and love to have your input. Any, anyone who's on, uh, we're designing this for next year's legislative session. So now it's time to have the conversation. All right. Our next question is from Reba and Reba asked, Childcare job postings are hiring under $20 an hour. Professionals can't afford to live in the region at that rate. How can we get them a raise? Uh, well, I think um, we made a significant investment in uh, childcare and early learning um, rates this year. And there are two aspects of what we have to do. One is we have to raise salaries, of course, and provide benefits. And we also have to increase the pipeline for training our early educators and child care facility educators. Um, and we are working on both. And um, I think, you know, if Senator Brock wants to jump in or Representative Valdez, but we really made a significant investment in um, expanding um, funding support for child care and how we pay our child care early learning providers um, and removing some of the crazy obstacles, our Working Connections child care program, which probably is better than half or more of the states, um, said that you not only had to be in community college, but you had to be working full time and going to school to qualify. Well, if you want to get someone a new opportunity, just have them go to school full time and provide childcare. Don't say you also have to work full time. And we've rolled that back. That's a big step forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, obviously it, it's a difficult question on how to, how to get wages up in those, um, uh, environments. The, many of them are private businesses. And uh, I think the, the fact that the state is willing to come in and, as I said, provide more subsidy means that demand will will be going up. And hopefully that'll cause these businesses to be more stable fiscally and they'll have to uh, and be in a position that they can raise wages uh, for the people that they have to recruit to come in. So that's what I hope will happen. But I think with the, the, the additional um, public funding will stabilize some of these private businesses and allow them to expand and hopefully make their finances work better so they can uh, increase wages. One other thing we also, I also wanted to mention, there was a special part of a bill that we uh, passed uh, to expand uh, in the individual insurance market, and we're really gonna be emphasizing childcare workers as a cohort of people. There are thousands of them who don't have access to healthcare. So I think they'll be able to get at the income levels that they have uh, much more subsidized health insurance on the in individual market, and that too will make it a more attractive position, I hope. Great, thank you. 
This next question is from John who said, I have a 2016 Chevy Volt and when I renew my license tabs, I have to pay an EV fee that is more than twice what I would pay in gas tax for a gas powered vehicle. When will the Washington State Legislature repeal this unreasonable and anti-environmental tax on electric vehicles? Um, I'm happy to, to tackle that question. And um, that's not the first time this question has been asked, uh, uh, for sure. I mean, yes, uh, that um, electric vehicle uh, surcharge was um, added um, a year or so ago. At the, I, st I still recall this um, in the uh, 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 negotiations between the House and the Senate uh, transportation uh, uh, budget team. Um, and it was, in, um, and, I, and it was um, uh, a request from uh, from the Senate side, Senate Transportation, and which ended up being part of the overall uh, uh, transportation bill, you know, a year or so ago. Um, and I know that when that uh, over the last you know couple of years, we have heard from a lot of folks in the district uh, about 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 that fee, having to pay the fee, um, and uh, and for the and for the reasons why they feel they should not have to pay that. Um, I'm sure, I mean, obviously here in 2021, um, most of the uh, 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 debate or discussion on the transportation budget was just, how do we just keep things going so we don't have to make, again, uh, uh, draconian cuts. And so I would imagine um, um, as part of next year's discussions, this will, I'm sure will, will come up again. Um, at the same time, you know, there are uh, some studies going on right now regarding uh, 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 road usage charge, for example, uh, to come back to the state legislature on perhaps there could be um, rather, you know, uh, how do we the, deal with the um, uh, declining revenue of the gas tax, uh, but how to ensure that um, all folks are, are paying for, uh, for the roads that, uh, that they use. So, um, yes, th thank you for the question. I know that it's still on the minds of, of many of you. Um, we haven't forgotten about it. Um, and again, let's just cross fingers that um, in next year's budget cycle, our transportation revenue is a little bit more steadier. And then um, um, hopefully we, uh, uh, we can address it again. All right, we are gonna try and fit in a last question here. This one is from Donna and Donna asks, would you consider sponsoring a bill to require a deposit for, for reusable bottles? That would be good for the environment and for climate change. Well, um, let me just say, Donna, thank you. I, I'm laughing because uh, when I was in college, which a while back now, um, I campaigned for bottle bill, deposit bill, and then law school here, I again fought for one. And um, uh, I think, yeah, you know, we do a fair job recycling, but we see the recycling market um, with big up and downs and questions. Um, and we need to, we've moved forward with saying we've got to have phase out of one time use plastics. So I'm all in favor of a bottle bill. I think they work and they work well. And it is one heck of a big fight against the soft drink and other manufacturers uh, in our state uh, and across the nation, but it's worth it because we've got to move away from one-time use and hoping that people do the right thing individually to recycle, um, especially when the recycling markets collapse and we don't have requirements that are stiff enough for um, a reused content. All right, we are actually gonna try and fit one more question in here. This one is from Tamara and Tamara asked, with so many other states restricting reproductive rights, what are you doing to ensure reproductive rights are protected? Well, thank you, uh, Tamara, Tamara, for that question. Um, I think that um, this is a very important issue. Uh, we see what's happening. I think the U.S. Supreme Court is going to be taking up a case, uh, and it's hard to say exactly what's going to happen. I think with the majority now uh, on the court uh, that Trump put in, I think it's uh, there's a real question as to what kinds of restrictions are gonna be allowed. Uh, what I would say to you is that we have constitutional, state constitutional protections in Washington that were passed by the voters 30 years ago to protect reproductive rights. And so I feel very uh, good about that. We've also passed the Reproductive Parity Act in recent years 
to ensure that there's uh, equity for those uh, in the health insurance market to make sure that they have an option to have plans uh, with um, a reproductive, uh, the full range of reproductive coverage, including abortion uh, coverage. Uh, and then this last year, we passed a bill that I think is very important uh, that uh, makes it um, uh, unlawful for employers in healthcare settings to um, penalize um, uh, providers, doctors, for giving advice uh, on, let's say, an ectopic pregnancy and what might need to happen in that situation. And even if they, if, even if their policy itself will not allow for that procedure to take place in their hospital, uh, let's say, they cannot go after uh, the uh, physician for giving medically appropriate advice given that situation. That was a very important protect, uh, protection that was put in place and was a key priority of the reproductive health uh, community this year. And I was a co-sponsor of that bill and we, we did pass it. All right, folks, that was our last question of the evening. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions for our lawmakers, either in the survey or in the comments. I am now going to turn it back over to them for some closing remarks. Senator Frock, can you please start us off with those? Well, I'll try to go very fast because I know uh, we, we are cut off right at seven. Uh, first of all, um, I know some people in the in the uh, chat did not get their questions answered. I'm sorry uh, that that happened. Send us a note. Uh, we each have e emails, and we'll try to get back to you on specific questions you may have. Uh, and but just know uh, we we look at all of them. I just want to thank people. Um, this will not be our last uh, community uh, meeting like this or community session like this um, of the year. I suspect we'll have another one uh, maybe in the fall or the late uh, summer or early fall. And then also we also do. A town hall meeting in uh, before the next session for sure in December or even sometimes in early January. And I expect and hope that with uh, vaccinations that we will be in a situation that everyone can get together in person and we can actually uh, talk and have a good discussion about all of these things. Uh, uh, so we'll just keep working on that. But mainly, I just want to say thank you again for your input and your interest. And please, uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate hearing from all of you during the session, it informs what we do. We have small staffs. We don't are not able to respond to every single email, but I don't want people to think that we don't see them and hear them and read them because we do. Thanks. I, I'm happy to go next, Joe Tager. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you tonight and answer your questions. Um, I know it's a, a very nice, uh, uh, great, great day, great evening out there. So I want to make sure you have. Time to go outside and enjoy uh, uh, tonight. Uh, but as Senator Frock alluded to, um, if we didn't get to your question, you know, please, uh, please, you know, uh, send us an email. Um, you know, we do our best to read them all, and our staff does. You know, uh, really does. Our, we only have one staff apiece, but um, then you know they work pretty hard to ensure that we see um, everything the, that we need to see as well. And I too, I look forward to uh, our next town hall and. I, and Hopefully that can be in person. If not, I'm sure the ones that we'll have in uh, late December, early January, uh, before the 2022 session, um, we'll, we'll, it'll be great to see all of you again uh, uh, once more face-to-face. Uh, -face. So thank you for the opportunity to be in here. Uh, and it is an honor uh, to represent all of you uh, uh, in Olympia. Thank you to both Senator Frank and Representative Valdez. Um, it's, it's a joy and an honor to share this responsibility and honor of representing you all. Um, and we do, as someone noted, we really collaborate and work hard together um, to make sure that we give the 46th district the best possible representation and put aside when we have an individual difference. And you can see that we really try to be a team together for, for you. And um, I will be resuming um, in person, my traveling town halls once a month on Saturday mornings. So you can email me for when they are after um, you're confident that we can go back out in public and have coffee um, with them. So for that, meantime, email all of us together at firstname.lgov. Like we'll try to respond to all the questions. And that is our evening tonight. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Like our lawmakers here said, uh, if we did not get to your question, you can directly reach out to your offices, and we're going to have a screen right after this with all of their contact information. So again, thank you so much for joining, and have a great evening.